Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Matt Bernico, the Elden Lord of the podcast. I'm Dean Deloff, the Elden Surf of the podcast, paying my tribute <laughs> to my co host. Yeah, yeah, please. You've got to. <laughs> You've got to. I have the big ring of power, and uh, you. <laughs> You don't, unfortunately. <laughs> I Maybe have... you could get it if you if you beat me in combat. That's right. You have the ring of power. I have the grain of power, however. And once all the rest of the serfs get together, uh, don't worry. You won't be eating. <laughs> we're all in trouble. Yeah, okay. Well, folks, we're not going to talk about Elden Ring on this podcast, even though I'd, I guess I'd like to tell you about how I've been rolling around and ducking these big bosses. <laughs> um, but, but we're not. But I won't, okay? I, I won't, right here. Um, we're going to talk about something that's urgent, an urgent matter. Um, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about Lent and all of the big Lenten themes. We've talked about fasting, temptation, charity. But here's the thing. We're running out of themes, and that's dangerous territory. So we're going to skip to one of the big themes um, that we think about or anticipate toward the end of the Lenten situation, <laughs> the Lenten season, <laughs> which is the crucifixion uh, of Jesus uh, on the cross. You know it. <laughs> we hate it. Um, but it does happen in uh, in the end of Lent, right? And then uh, after after Lent, you all know the good one that comes. We transition to the Easter season, and uh, that one's way more fun. We're more excited about that. Jesus coming back is great. Jesus dying, less great. Right. The Easter situation as opposed to the Lenten situation, as you just put it. That's right. You got to have both, I guess. <laughs> and they're both situations. I mean, there's no other way to explain them. They are deeply situational it's true um you know we'll we'll get to easter later on we've talked about resurrection on the show probably not too long ago but we'll have to return to it during the appropriate time but for this episode we are going to skip a little bit ahead into the crucifixion and we're going to talk about what theologians called soteriology or the study of salvation a big two dollar word that you can get at a bible school for a degree that costs way more than two dollars and we'll have you paying it off for many more years to come uh we're giving it to you for free that's right that's the, <laughs> the magnificent passing guarantee. on this value to you it's great <laughs> yeah discount theology over here on this podcast for sure um christians have a lot of uh what we call theories of atonement which is kind of the uh, theories of, of what Jesus does to save us or what's going on in the crucifixion, what's the meaning of the crucifixion. So, for example, you've probably heard of um, a, a story that's told where Jesus dies on the cross, and in doing so, he takes all of our sins on himself that actually we have to pay, right? We owe God this big debt of bad stuff, but Jesus takes it and pays it on our behalf, um, and then we don't have to go to hell. Right. So that's kind of a pretty uh, standard story that we have in our culture, but it's very complicated when you start thinking about it very hard. Why did God want to kill his son in order to save the world? <laughs> Maybe he could have had a better idea. I don't know. This seems like pretty convoluted as a way to uh, save the planet. Um, there are lots of other fun theories of atonement. Uh, there's one called Christus Victor, for example, where uh, Jesus is crucified and then he goes to hell to kick the devil's butt and everybody's saved. And it's narratively very fun, but also complicated. There's like, uh, let's see, there's a ransom theory, which is very similar oh, to Christmas yeah. Victor, where like <laughs> the devil has all of all of humanity in his little uh, pocket bag, his little purse. And uh, he's like, these are all mine. And then Jesus pulls a fast one on him and steals it <laughs> and pays a ransom and saves us all. Uh, you know, all these wild ideas that Christians thought about for many years about how to make sense of uh, of the crucifixion. And we'll talk more about it in the episode uh, or maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. But we're going to go ultimately in a different direction and work through the idea of this really great Salvadoran liberation theologian named Ignacio Eacuria, uh, an amazing Jesuit who was also killed by uh, right-wing paramilitary. Um, he wrote an essay that was something really unique, uh, or that says something really unique about salvation and complicates a more individualistic reading. And it kind of carries on this theme we've been talking about through Lent, which is how to politicize some of these ideas that are more spiritual. And I think you really don't get more spiritual than <laughs> the, the crucifixion, right? Like, that's how we all sort of, as Christians, tend to understand ourselves, for better or for worse, in relation to God in kind of a deep way, right? Thinking about how we plot Jesus's redemption of the world and so on. So Eucharia is a great pathway to thinking about how to deal with that in a way that, uh, you know, has some meaning for our, our politics, our material life, and not just making us feel bad about ourselves. Yeah, totally. So the A Curia piece is really interesting. And um, I don't know, I think it, uh, it won me over. I'm into it. So 
um, let's see, we, we've got a lot of big words out here on the table. We got theories, we got um, <laughs> uh, soteriology. It's all great. Um, theology, it's complicated. Um, and I would have to say that the essay from A. Curia is also kind of complicated, uh, he being a theologian and all. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world to read. So here's a quick TLDR of like what, what he's kind of getting after, and then we'll explain it more, I think, as we go. So we can map the crucifixion of Jesus onto the lived experience of what he calls crucified people um, who live in the world. So um, the crucifixion of Jesus is something that Aecaria sees happening to other people too. Um, the the I guess the poor and dispossessed, I suppose you might say. And when we make that connection, we can understand that salvation isn't something that happens like individualistically, but it's something that we actively participate in. So the big idea for Aecaria in this sort of like way of talking about salvation is that Jesus' crucifixion happened because of the historical conditions of society. And in a similar way, the crucifixion of poor people happens because of the same reasons, right? Um, we live in a society that just keeps on crucifying people. And I mean, it's bad. We should stop that from happening. And that's kind of the end point, right? Is that uh, when we encounter crucifixion, we should be trying to take Jesus and the crucified people off the cross. And that's sort of our participatory moment in this grand um, metaphysical situation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll put a pin in a curia. I'm sure everybody's excited about it. I'm excited <laughs> about it. it. It's great. It, it's, it's good. Um, and we're going to come around to it. But I think uh, to really earn the full energy of that excitement, it does help to pass through the extremely bizarre uh, world of atonement theory, what it does, how it operates in capitalism. And, you know, there's books you can read, there are essays you can read, it's all out there. But I thought maybe the best way actually for us to get into this is just to uh, shoot the breeze. Is that what they say? Shoot the breeze? Who says no. that? You shoot, you shoot the shit, but what do you do with the breeze? Oh, you... I think you shoot the breeze too. Okay. We're going to shoot the breeze yeah. about uh, it still sounds wrong, but that's what we're going to do uh, about atonement a little bit more casually, I think. Um, you know, I think that for evangelicals in particular, and, you know, Matt and I both have this uh, kind of evangelical moment in our lives that was very formative. Uh, atonement is really kind of where it's at, right? Trying to plot how you relate to Jesus's saving work is something that messes a lot of people up. Um, it is also something that is deeply related to how we understand ourselves in capitalism. Right. It uh, functions really conveniently. Uh, certain atonement theories that is function very conveniently for a, a capitalist society. And, you know, maybe there's too much made of, you know, I, don't, I would never want to tell an idealist story that says, like, once Christians decided to tell atonement theories in this particular way, then we got capitalism, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's something to it. <laughs> there's part of that that is there. So I don't know, Matt, maybe we can sort of uh, work from our own experience here, yeah. extrapolate some of that, and then we'll uh, get to Aecuria. You know, I think we talked about atonement theory most explicitly in the conversation we had a while back about debt and how that all kind of works. Though yeah. I think to me, yeah. the more viscerally <laughs> explanatory moment is uh, when I went to go see The Passion of the Christ with my youth group. Um, I always have to exploit my evangelical past for this podcast. And I guess that this is what I do instead of therapy, I guess. Um, <laughs> probably a bad <laughs> impulse, but I'm following it right now. So Passion of the Christ, I don't know. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. It sounds, <laughs> the movie is just the way that it sounds. It's about Jesus's crucifixion. I got to tell you, it's not a great movie for kids to watch. I shouldn't have watched it. I regret it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really like gory <laughs> and bloody retelling of the crucifixion story, which I mean, I guess, you know, it would have been. So it's not like inaccurate in that sense. But the whole point of the movie is to drive home the key evangelical finding that this dude, Jesus, he did something big for you. He got killed so that you wouldn't go to hell. And you should like really consider that viscerally. I mean, it's I say it's evangelical, but I think that there's um there's a history of like even I don't know, the Jesuits doing that kind of thing. Right. That's like this is a. Yeah. I mean, it's a Mel Gibson movie, right? That's like, true. A good Catholic. point. Um, he's Catholic, but you know, it's like, th there's this, um, uh, maybe the best way to put it is this, well, this is not the best way to put it, but this is like an analog to maybe explain some of it. So in the, in the practice of like, uh, the Jesuit spiritual disciplines, there is this thing that you do where you're sort of contemplating the reality of things in these sort of like palace of the mind kind of ways, but the Jesuits in like the sort of, I don't know, 
for lack of a better term, like the Renaissance and yeah, I guess the Renaissance basically, they kind of took those spiritual practices and disciplines of like contemplating hell or contemplating the crucifixion. And they're like, well, what if we just made plays about them? <laughs> and that's what they did. Like, so, you know, <laughs> rich aristocratic kids would go to like Jesuit run universities and they would see morality plays about the crucifixion or about hell, uh, about hell or the devil tempting you or whatever. And I think that's kind of the way that the passion of the Christ works. It's, it's showing you this like viscerally real thing and trying to make you think, a real particular thing about uh, Jesus and uh, theology and how that all kind of shakes out in the end. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the passion is a great place to start because it was a cultural moment, right? And it tells us a lot about what I think, especially U.S. culture is invested in, whether you're Catholic or evangelical, when it comes to Jesus, which is he is the ultimate mm -hmm. victim, right? That that movie is basically a yeah, kind of tortured yeah, right. porn film. Um, just watching somebody get abused for a very long time uh, with some anti-Semitism <laughs> yeah. sprinkled in there here and there. Uh, lots of stuff going on. But the idea is that, you know, Jesus uh, went through all this stuff. And at the end of the day, yeah. it is, it that's is right. your fault that that happened. And that is that actually is a really the important kicker. piece of it, right? It is your fault. And that's why you should be very thankful to Jesus, right? It's your fault. It was your sins. Mm -hmm. uh, and this guy is kind of making this, uh, you know, one big atonement, uh, this one big, this one big like blood sacrifice, I guess, so that you don't wind up in hell. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're right. We did talk about this a little bit in the dead episode, but it's worth revisiting uh, because it really has a lot to do with um, debt. There is there's also kind of a legal right. metaphor that's very interesting. And I think those are at least the two most popular ones I heard in evangelicalism and elsewhere. I hear it in, in some Catholic spaces, too. Um, so the short of it is this is maybe one of the most powerful ways of or most popular ways of articulating atonement theory in the U.S. Um, so as we were just saying, Jesus is the ultimate victim. He goes through all this bad shit and it is your fault. So why is it your fault? So the kind of economic way of telling it is uh, you sin, everybody sins, you're born with sin, original sin, right? You can't get rid of it. And uh, you, what do you do? You keep on sinning, you <laughs> big bad child, you big bad six year old who took that thing from your sister and earned yourself a place in hell. Um, that is all very bad news, right? So you go through life accruing all this sin, and the sin almost kind of like racks up even interest, like it <laughs> it compounds over time, right? It gets worse and worse. You have this huge debt, and you could never pay it off yourself because the price of even one sin is hell. So all of a sudden you've got all these sins and you should go to hell for eternity, right? So the idea is Jesus makes this sort of deal with God the Father. So God's making a deal with God's self in this bizarre Trinitarian it's, way. That's why it's bad. <laughs> yeah, very bad. Um, and Jesus is like, I'll take on all the sin of the world, all the debt, and pay it off, right? That's kind of the stuff you even hear in hymns. Jesus paid it all. Um, and through Jesus's blood, we all get to skip hell as our payment and we, we get off, right? So Jesus pays our, our, our debt. Um, it's, uh, it's credited to us. So that's kind of the economic side. There's a legal side too, where it's like, it functions basically the same, but the metaphor is helpful to understand. So like you, again, you did all the sins and now you're standing before a judge, God, the father, and the judgment is very clear because the law is very clear. If you do these sins, you go to hell. Uh, and at the last moment, Jesus, expert lawyer, Jesus, LLC, um, <laughs> LLC, I've not, no, something else. Jesus, Esquire, Esquire. <laughs> Jesus, S. Christer. He runs into <laughs> the courtroom and, uh, you know, he, he yells objection briefcase. Yeah. He yells objection. Yeah. He puts his big briefcase on the desk and, uh, he shows the evidence of, you know, him dying on the cross and offers to serve your sentence for you essentially, or, at least uh, offers an alternative punishment, you know. Um, and again, you you get off scot-free or whatever, and Jesus takes the punishment that you should have taken in the crucifixion. So this is kind of, you can see this, it's often called substitutionary atonement, right? right? There's the, a substitution happening. Jesus does what you actually deserve, and that is a, a recipe for all kinds of weird psychological problems, <laughs> right? You end up uh, uh, feeling bad about yourself. Um, you feel bad you for Jesus. Over you feel bad for Jesus, and that becomes, like, a really gross feedback loop for a lot of folks. I think the, um, the most, and, like, scathing thing... Okay, so this is... Uh, I talked about Passion of the Christ. I've explored that part of my past. But also there's another book called The Shack. I don't know if you're familiar with this book, Dean. Yeah, yeah. 
in the book, it like uh, it's supposed to be sort of this like honest sort of reckoning where this guy goes to a shack in the woods and he talks to God in these different ways. And uh, there's this interesting part though. It, it's bad. I think it's it sucks. But anyways, <laughs> there's this part of it though where um, this guy is talking to to God. Uh, you know, one of them, one of <laughs> one of the uh, the three the three <laughs> gods in this book, which is uh, problematic. But it happens in the book. So what, what can you do? But uh, the conversation that they end up happening is that like, well, if you think if, if you if you take substitutionary atonement as like a real true thing, then it gets you into this complicated hot water where like. God argues with himself in this weird way where, like, Jesus is trying to make a really good case for you, but God is, like, bound by some other type of law <laughs> mm-hmm. that, like, I guess you can only imagine that God, God's self has made. So you you wind up in this weird situation where there must be a higher power than God if God has to obey mm-hmm. these laws to send you to hell and Jesus mm-hmm. has to, like, intervene. It makes it, – it's not a very good idea. It's very complicated and stupid right. and – um, I don't know. Not satisfactory as a as a young evangelical, I have to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there are so many ways to poke holes in it. I think one of my favorite ones. Um, so part of this also involves right. If you are offered the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and you reject it, then you go to hell. That's mm-hmm. the idea. So there's a big speculative problem in evangelicalism, especially about people who never got to hear about Jesus. Do they go to hell or not? And so you have some evangelicals who say yes, and that's why missionary work is so important. And then you get others who are willing to maybe be like, well, maybe they don't they don't go to hell if they never get a chance to hear it, but they're not getting an opportunity to live the fullness that Jesus invites them to unless they get to hear it, right? Uh, but uh, one of the funniest things in the world is like, if you're the kind of person who says that they don't uh, go to hell if they don't ever hear about Jesus Christ, then the very, very last thing you should do is ever offer someone the gift of salvation because if they reject it, they go to hell. But if they don't get it, they're basically fine, right? So it's like the more you think about these things, uh, the more you kind of realize it unravels. There's this uh, thought experiment in, I don't know, in like the philosophy of computer science, which is a weird subfield. But it's this uh, thought experiment about, it's called the basilisk. And uh, so generally (laughs) the way that it goes is that like, Suppose that sometime in the future that there is a malevolent AI that wants to kill all humans. And if you've even thought um, – if you thought about the fact that there could be a malevolent AI that um, that could kill all humans and you think that's bad, like you're putting yourself at risk for future termination by this uh, by this uh, mm-hmm. this mean computer. So, I mean, you know, in, <laughs> in different ways, uh, atonement theory makes God to be the mean computer. And uh, I, I got to tell you, that's bad. You shouldn't think like that. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, as we said earlier, there's lots of other ways of doing atonement theory. One thing, you know, it's hard to imagine substitutionary atonement actually comes pretty late on the scene in Christianity in a unified way. Like it's present across the tradition in lots of kind of, you know, germinating forms, but it doesn't really get going really until like a thousand years into (laughs) church history. And uh, even then takes time to sort of unify as a common way of, you know, experiencing the crucifixion and there's lots of competing theories around atonement for those many hundreds of years um so i mentioned a few ransom theory uh that is a very fun one there's a ton of other ones they get wilder and wilder a lot of experiments in the early church but one thing that is very interesting is even in the most kind of metaphysical stories like the ransom theory jesus is still imagined as somebody who is actually yeah, liberating human true. beings from sin um so liberating them from their own sin, but also from the devil, yeah. right? This like evil power in the world. Well, that's why Christus Victor is cool too. I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so it's like there's that impulse there in the Christian tradition, even though it gets articulated in these weird ways. Um, I mean, you might find yourself asking and probably should ask, like, why did Christians ever feel the need to inflate the crucifixion to such a <laughs> like to raise the metaphysical stakes so high that you have to have this kind of cosmic drama going on? And I don't have a good yeah. answer for that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just know if you figure it out. Yeah, exactly. But I do think there's something interesting that even at the kind of the metaphysical heights, you still get this sort of liberation pulse that's coming through it in this interesting way. Yeah. Totally. Well, that's been 20 minutes on us sort of oh, – it's, it's, sorry, it's been 20 minutes on me rehashing my weird past <laughs> with this particular theological idea and Dean kind of just kind of giving the uh, giving the big details, and that's really great. I appreciate that. Uh, Dean, let's talk about Aecuria, though, and get on the right track. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, toward, a, toward a more compelling theory of uh, not atonement, something different. I don't know what we want to talk about, <laughs> yeah. but it's a theory of soter- soteriology for sure. Yeah, so Aecuria – uh, he, as I said, was this great Jesuit in El Salvador. 
Um, he was involved in this thing called the UCA or the UCA, um, basically the Central American University. And uh, he did a lot of really interesting work in liberation theology. He wrote a bunch of books. Um, he was also doing theology at a time of civil war. We just remembered Oscar Romero's uh, assassination this past week. Um, so a sir he survived longer than Romero, but himself was eventually killed as well in El Salvador, along with uh, some other Jesuits and other people who were at the university um, in a, an awful massacre. So a person who not only wrote about liberation theology and, and about crucifixion and so on, but became really, uh, unfortunately, you know, embodied sort of the most tragic parts of his own thought, right? A, a victim of this very process of repression. So when I whenever I think about crucifixion, I pretty much always think of A. Curia. And in particular, I think of this essay, it is called The Crucified People, as simple as that. And it appears in this volume called Systematic Theology uh, that is edited by John Sabrino, this other interesting guy, and A. Curia. And actually, if you want to hear more about that book, you should go check out David Inchowskis, this awesome Jesuit, has a podcast that's just called the Liber Liberation Theology Podcast, where he's been going through this book like chapter by chapter. So you can learn a lot more about theology from someone who actually knows what they're talking about there. Uh, but I always think about this essay because A. Curia's life speaks to the very topic he's talking about, right? Le the crucified people. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but it's also a really neat uh, theological attempt to deal with like some theology problems in a theology way and come out of it in a way that is actually meaningful to me right. <laughs> as opposed to being more theological jargon. So Matt, I know, uh, you know, it's always, I feel like um, twisting your arm to get you to read some, some proper theology <laughs> on this podcast. And uh, so to. I'm curious to hear your, your first impressions. What do you think of this uh, approach from Aya Curia? Uh, it's cool because it is dealing with something real <laughs> as opposed to something made up and strange. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, let me let me show you what I mean. Um, OK, this is from the very beginning of the essay. Uh, a. Curia says this it is precisely the reign of sin that continues to crucify most of humankind and that obliges us to make real in history the death of Jesus as he actualized Passover of the reign of God. OK, this is an important piece to start with because, OK, we think of ourselves as individual sinners and Jesus is the person who saves us. And isn't that great? But um what this tells us is something a little bit different, that uh, that Jesus being crucified on the cross is not really for our sins, um, but by our sins. And and that's the same way that the the, the crucified people of the world, um, you know, the poor, the proletariat, the lumpen, however we want to kind of conceptualize them, I suppose, which it's, it's important. But, um, you know, however we choose to do that. Those same forces that crucified Jesus, the same sins that crucified Jesus, the Roman Empire, um, and so on, right? They're the same forces that crucify and continue to crucify um, poor and, like, working class people even even now, right? So that's the big important piece of this. I guess that's, like, maybe the place to start. Um, it's not, like – it's not that Jesus, like, is sacrificing himself, but it's, like, that the larger systemic or structural sins of the world are what are, are killing Jesus and killing the crucified people. Yeah, exactly. So what you really get in this essay, I think, is a, a profound kind of alternative theory of what Jesus's death means, what salvation means, and it's tied directly to human beings, right, to collective human beings today. So usually atonement theories, they pump up a singular historical event, right, or and a, and a metaphysical idea that the death of Jesus Christ, uh, an individual person at a specific moment in history, that is what changes the course of everything. But A. Akiri asks this great question in the beginning of the essay where he's basically like, well, if Jesus changes the whole course of history by dying on the cross, then why is it that so many people are suffering right now from oppression, you know, totally unnecessary oppression? And by tying Jesus's crucifixion to the crucifixion of, of people uh, and by making sin also a more kind of structural and expansive category, we get this total like reconfiguration of all these kind of classic motifs in soteriology, so in the way we understand salvation, and uh, a lot of interesting angles on that crucifixion side in general. So, Matt, I'm glad to hear that it landed. Yeah, totally. You know, it actually, I was reading through this, and it was reminding me of this song that I know. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this band. It's called AJJ, or they used to be called Andrew Jackson Jihad. Mm -hmm. 
Yikes. Um, but they uh, they sing a lot about Jesus, uh, which, I mean, how can you not, I suppose, if you <laughs> grow up in the United States as a sort of millennial person. But uh, there's a song that they have called Temple Grandin that's really tough, actually, to think about. Um, but in the song, there's a line that uh, the world was born to kill all the Jesuses. And I guess that's kind of what this makes me think of, that these uh, the world, all these like structures, they're there. To, to carry out sort of systems of death. And like, you know, Marxists know that. I think even a lot of sort of like social Democrats and liberals know that. Um, but like our theology doesn't reflect the the real sort of existing stakes of these things. And uh, we trade it out for like a weird, mm-hmm. yeah, metaphysical event rather than taking it seriously as a historical, uh, a historical thing that happens not just to Jesus, but what happens to poor people across the board. Yeah, so we can get into maybe some of the weeds of this essay in a minute, but I think that's exactly right. You know, that um, it, the world is is born to kill all the Jesuses. That's exactly what A.A. Curie is, is talking about. So really trying to expand or multiply the event of the crucifixion um, rather than, you know, reduce it and contract it to a, a fixed point or a fixed metaphysical idea. Um, but what I love about A.A. Curie is I think you see this in a lot of progressive theologies who have a motivation I can understand, but a kind of solution that I just don't resonate with, I guess, which is to say uh, a lot of progressive theologies, when they come to something like the crucifixion and atonement, they'll kind of, um, uh, I guess, take out all the the metaphysical mm. tradition entirely. And so at the 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 one end of the pole, you get a completely materialist um, approach to Jesus with no metaphysical meaning at all, right? Jesus is just a person who got killed and like an inspiring story about social justice for sure, but you know, right. that's kind of all there is to say about it. Um, or you kind of get like an approach that says, well, all that metaphysical stuff, you can kind of, I don't know, bracket it. At the end of the day, Jesus saves us and there's it's like <laughs> what a big mystery, right? That, that's kind of the the other side that progressive theologians will sometimes do. Uh what's great about Aecuria is he really um engages the tradition of thinking about soteriology in this critical way, uh, but wants to preserve some of the most like I don't know how to put it, like the most textured mm-hmm. part of uh of soteriology in general. So I'll just give you one example. Um so there's a big conversation in soteriology over whether or not Jesus's, Jesus's death is necessary, right? Did Jesus have to die? Like when God created the world and set history in motion, did God do that knowing that Jesus was going to have to die and, and that would be how it had to go? It couldn't be otherwise. So, so there's a historical necessity there. So if you're a good progressive theologian, you say, of course not. That's goofy and silly and doesn't make any sense. So no, you know, and it's as simple as that. Uh, but what I like about Aikiri is he kind of threads the needle a little bit differently. So he's, he says this, we may admit that the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of the people are necessary. Yeah. Spooky sentence to begin with. But then he says, but only if we speak of a necessity in history and not a merely natural necessity. It is precisely their nature as historic necessity that clarifies the deep reality of what happens in history at the same time as it opens the way toward transforming history. That would not be the case if we were dealing with a merely natural necessity. So I'll kind of maybe parse that out for a minute. We can talk more about it. Um, what Aikiri is saying here is a natural necessity would be something like, you know, uh, like what I was just saying, that there's this kind of natural path to history that has to necessarily involve Jesus dying on the cross. Um, and for that matter, it involves all the suffering of everybody else in, in history too, right? That's just all kind of part of God's mm-hmm. big, bizarre, divine plan <laughs> that I don't like being part of, <laughs> right? Um, but what uh, A. Curious says is it's a historical necessity, which means not that it had to happen so that history could occur, but rather that it tells us something about sort of like yeah. the laws of history, which for Aea Curier are really the laws of mm-hmm. oppression and, and liberation. So there's a sort of gloss on Marx here. He doesn't go as far as to say, you know, it tells us about the, the yeah. laws of class struggle, for example, although class struggle is, is big in this essay. But it's a more expansive confrontation, he says, between the structures of sin and the reign of God. Those are kind of his two big polarities. So the historical necessity is that in a world that is full of sin, if you try to be part of the reign of God, of bringing the kingdom of God to earth, you are inevitably going to be yeah. on the crucified side, right? You're you're going to get fucked. And that is a necessity in history, 
not because it has to be that way, but because we just know that that is what history is like. It, it is, you know, mm-hmm. it, it kills all the Christs. Uh, and I think that is a really interesting way of like <laughs> preserving that really weird question around yeah. is the crucifixion you know, necessary? Uh, you said it's a gloss on Marx and he doesn't go as far to say this uh, class struggle works or whatever. And I think that you're right in both accounts. That's true. But also this ends up being, I think, more radical than Marx because not only is like class struggle the, yeah, like is it a historical like reality or something that it just happens because capitalism kind of creates these contradictions or whatever, but it puts, it puts class struggle on a very like cosmic scale and to identify with the proletariat or the lumpen or the poor, again, whatever word we choose to use, they're all great. I like them all. Um, <laughs> we identify with God, but like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you all that that's that's the class struggle it's like you know to be a christian is to be like deeply involved in um stopping crucifixions or or not i guess exactly and uh a curry also talks more in here a little bit about um jesus's death on the cross being necessary or not for a curry it's a, a kind of transformative moment because uh when jesus dies it's both a revelation of the injustice of the system that he's part of the historical reality of that system and it is this kind of affirmation it, it's like a i think he calls it a verification of christ's um mm. commitment yeah. to the reign of god right um and you you get that all the time in the Bible where Jesus says, like, on the one hand, they'll know that you're Christians by by your love. But on the other hand, the world will hate you because of me. Right. There's this kind of uh, duality yeah. there that you get in the Bible. And so Aokiri is picking up on that as well, that um, the death of Christ on the cross is is that it's this confirmation that Jesus is trying to transform history, is trying to sort of do something different uh, outside of the logic of the world. And that's what happens to people who do that. Yeah. I think it's really compelling, though, because, you know, atonement theory would make you ask the dumb question. Like, well, why does God make Jesus a sacrifice? Like, why, you know, <laughs> why? It's a such a bonkers and sort of convoluted way to save humanity. Like, why is that the case? But this flips it because it's just like, well, no, it's not that God is making this happen. It's that, like, the structures of sin, it's the, the structures of oppression. It's all of the people involved in, I don't know, <laughs> like, um, First century Palestinian colonialism mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Like um, it, these things happen not because God is like willing them to, but it, because like this is what always happens to poor people in oppressive societies. They get ground up and spit out and killed in the process. And I don't know, that seems uh, to make a lot more sense and is more compelling to me than like God orchestrated this very weird thing to happen. I mean, at, at the end of the day, Jesus is like a worker. He's sort of an itinerant preacher. He doesn't have like a house. He has no place to lay his heads in the Bible. Can't argue with that. <laughs> like, of course, this is what happens. This is what always happens to people like that, right? This is um, this is the historical necessity of it, and it shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. I guess is the maybe next step. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, what else is interesting about it is the it shouldn't piece, right? Like the protest of it is so important. So also in. Uh, the history of soteriology, there's this idea of um, it's called the happy fault. Uh, There's a Latin word for it, but I can't remember it right now. Um, A a bad Catholic moment real quick. But um, (laughs) the idea is that like the, when Adam and Eve eat eat the apple, when sin enters the world, it's of course an awful thing. It's a big tragedy. It's a fault, but it's a happy fault because it means that Jesus gets to come rescue us and save the day by dying on the cross later on. And, (laughs) It's weird. <laughs> it's a very weird. What a way to think about the world. Yeah. What a way. Like yes. you're inventing a reason that something had to happen rather than just taking the obvious reason. <laughs> it had to happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting because it, for Aokiria, sin is not a happy fault and it doesn't do Jesus any good or us any good that sin is in the world. Like Jesus isn't glorified by saving us from sin in that kind of way, like in the kind of substitutionary way or whatever. Um, Jesus is really... A, because- well, yeah, go ahead. Because nothing, nothing changes. Yeah. Everything is still the same, right? There's, there's no, there, there's no glory to be had. It's just like the world continues on and keeps grinding people up and spitting them out. Exactly. And that's it. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a dumb way to think. Exactly. And uh, what Akira Akir- does here is he he adds on to this, saying, um, uh, so God gives this kind of you know gift of salvation or something like that. Uh, but A. Curie says the effort of human beings is not excluded, but in fact is required, especially for destroying the objective embodiment of sin and then oh, for yeah. building up the objective embodiment of grace. 
Otherwise, necessity would not have any historic character, but would be purely natural, and the human being would either be the absolute negation of God (laughs) or a mere (laughs) executor of presumably divine designs, right? So the idea here is uh, God might kind of present the alternative to a structure of sin, right? God is the dream of liberation or the embodiment of liberation or or the minister of liberation in Jesus's case or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, humans are invited into that and required for that to happen, that uh, what Jesus's death on the cross does is kind of create this fissure in the structures of sin. And it's up to the rest of us to, to actually open up that fissure even further, right? Um, otherwise you end up in this really weird, he calls it a a natural necessity, but it's kind of the happy fault idea where humans are sort of the, the enemies of God, uh, in this like bizarre fate, fate way that they can't get out of, uh, or they just sort of do whatever God designs them to do on this big cosmic chessboard. And at that point it's kind of like, I don't know who cares. Sorry, Calvinists, (laughs) it's just (laughs) how it is. Right. So I think that sort of participatory piece being built into the soteriology is also really unique in Aegeria. It is unique. It's something that we're going to keep talking about here in a hot second. Um, Before we do, I do want to like, I want to keep this moving because we don't have a lot of time and I want to get to the good stuff. So we're going to do it. Um, So I guess on this, on this historical necessity bit, right? So Aegeria goes on to say that Jesus was regarded as a blasphemer, one who is destroying the traditional religious order, one who upset the social structure, a political agitator, and so forth. It's all simply to recognize from quite distinct angles that the activity, word, and very person of Jesus in the proclamation of the reign, which is his word again, were so assertive and so against the established order and basic institutions that they had to be punished by death. And then this is the, I think, really important part for everyone to hear. <laughs> Dehistoricizing this radical reality leads to the mystical approaches to the problem, not by way of deepening, but by way of escape. We cannot simply set the matter of he died for our sins by means of the expiatory victim, thereby leaving the direction of history untouched. I guess this is what I was trying to say a minute ago, but this is saying it way better than I did. Um, great. Um, but <laughs> that's right. It, it, like if Jesus is nothing but like a big cosmic chessboard, like you're kind of saying, um, and it doesn't and, and Jesus's death does not change history. It doesn't like it doesn't make us do something different Then I don't know. That's nothing. <laughs> We're doing nothing. And I don't know. We should consider that. Um, I think that that's like, I think, far more troubling than Jesus died for you. And um, now you should be like his best friend or whatever mm-hmm. uh, in your in your brain. Right. This is a, a more grounded meaning that you have to do something like that. This uh, the death of Jesus, the death of God on the cross has to mean something materially to you, um, not just like in a cosmic sense. And and what, what it should mean materially is that like Jesus was crucified because that's the way that a, like, that's the way an oppressive system would deal with somebody who is everything a curious just said that he was a blasphemer, a political agitator and so on. And it's the same way that our system deals with people who are blasphemers and political agitators and so on. I mean, it's bad, right? So you have to do something and it's, um, it's, it can't just be metaphysical. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's a big piece of a curious, uh, approach here as well as to say that it's not just metaphysical, it's historical. He, he calls it even a historic soteriology. That's kind of the adjective he likes to use. And in one place, he says, uh, historic soteriology is a matter of seeking where and how the saving action of Jesus was carried out in order to pursue it in history. Uh, he goes on to say kind of what this means, but he says the continuity that we have today uh, with Jesus's um, death and life is not purely mystical and sacramental, just as his activity on earth was not purely myst- mystical and sacramental. In other words, worship, including the celebration of the Eucharist, is not the whole of the presence and continuity of Jesus. Uh, Pretty wild thing to say, by the way. There must be a continuation in history that carries out what he carried out in his life, and as he carried it out. We should acknowledge a trans-historic dimension to Jesus' activity, as we should acknowledge it in his personal biography, but his trans-historic dimension will only be real if it is indeed trans-historic, that is, if it goes through history. Uh, and I love that. I love that it has to go through history. And like, that's on us. Like Jesus isn't here to do that right now. So we have to figure that out. There's a, you know, there's, there's a Utah Phillips song. Well, it's not a Utah Phillips song. It's a, it's a folk song about Joe Hill. You might know about him. He's a, a great <laughs> labor organizer from the IWW. He was Swedish. I think he was killed by a firing squad in Salt Lake city. Anyways. So there's a song that, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Everyone's song about him. Utah Phillips. Um, what do you got? Three. Pete Seeger, all these, all these great guys. <laughs> Anyways, the 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 song is called "The Ballad of Joe Hill," and in the song, the person 
is dreaming that they saw Joe Hill. And um, the, the kind of interesting part of the song, though, is that Joe Hill is in the stream talking to whoever <laughs> and saying, no, I, I didn't die, right? I, I'm still alive. And the sense in the song is that uh, what what they couldn't kill of Joe Hill, you know, it went on to organize the rest of the labor movement, that the death of Joe Hill was like this like sort of transformative moment for labor in the United States so that like um, people would keep on fighting, that they would keep on being other types of Joe Hills in the world. Right. And, and mm-hmm. you know, it maybe not a perfect analogy or something, but there's something very similar in those ways of thinking that uh, Joe Hill gets killed. And the part of the part of Joe Hill that you can't kill. Right. It's still there. And, and that's what trans historically changes people's lives and actions um, and keeps people mm-hmm. fighting. And I think that there's something similar to say for this type of historic soteriology. Mm hmm. And that is such a powerful tradition on the left in general, right? Like John Brown has this kind of uh, yeah. his his body lies a moldering in the grave, but people are still singing about him, right? And that's a, a big threat. Um, or you can even think maybe in a more uh, more recent sense, um, people like Fred Hampton or Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, they have this kind of ongoing life that that continues to repeat. And for Aikaria, that also continues. I think this participation in the kind of historic soteriology, yeah. Well, let's talk about this term crucified people here for a minute, because that's a big part of it, right? We've we've kind of alluded to it already, and we've said some things about it, but here's Aikuria. He says, what is meant by crucified people here is that collective body, which as the majority of humankind owes its situation of crucifixion to the way society is organized and maintained by a minority that exercises its dominion through a series of factors, which taken together and given their concrete impact with within history must be regarded as sin. This is not purely individual way of looking at every person. Um, and it kind of goes on to to explain the more collective nature of this understanding. But but this is important. This is an important piece of the puzzle, right? That there are a group of people that Aikuria identifies as crucified, right? The crucified people are the people who whose lives, their work, their labor, their like everyday sort of grind makes the lives of the wealthy possible. Um, and that's that's it. That's who they are. And and that's who Aikuria um, identifies with Jesus. That these are concrete people within history, just like. The um, just like the structures of oppression within the society of, you know, Jesus crushed him and, and crucified him. The the structures of sin with our own society crucify these people, right? Not just in our country, but around the world. There are a crucified people um, and society is organized in such a way that means that they will always be crucified people unless we intervene. Mm hmm. And there is actually a lot of complexity to Aikuria. Sometimes when people talk about liberation theology, especially in terms of the oppressed and oppressor or liberation of the oppressed and so on, uh, there is some pushback that is to say, well, these are kind of dualistic terms, right? Or they're, they're too clean, too neat and tidy. Who's really oppressed? Who's really the oppressor? All that kind of stuff. What happens when you scale up, you know, is so if you're like a person making minimum wage at a McDonald's, you're oppressed for sure. But like the person who is making even less than that in, you know, whatever, like Indonesia to make sure that that person at McDonald's can get a phone or whatever. Like, are they being oppressed by the the, the McDonald's worker? All that kind of stuff like these are real complicated conversations, even on the left. Um, but especially among, I think, weird conservative Christians, you get this kind of dismissal of it. And in Aikuria, the idea that the crucified people are this kind of collective that you could talk about in a collective way is something he spends a lot of time trying to uh, piece together and analyze very carefully. So, for example, he even talks a little bit about what he calls uh, subsystems of crucifixion that exist both among oppressors and the oppressed, right? So he'll say, like, um, not everybody who is actually oppressed uh, is is virtuous, right? Or they might even betray their fellow oppressed peoples and uh, end up giving into the oppressor, or working in the service of the oppressor. So he doesn't have this kind of like he calls it a, a Manichaean view, right? This strict duality view of of good versus evil, oppressed versus oppressor. Um, but nevertheless, he wants to have this. Uh, he wants to say we have to talk in these collective terms about crucified people about the oppressed, about the oppressor, because at the end of the day, as he says, uh, when you take all these different factors of domination together, what you get is a concept like sin. (laughs) It's not just um, a bunch of bad stuff or just even an economic system. There's something uh, a lot richer than that in in a a horrifying way, right? And I think that's what I really like about Aikuria. There's this move 
from the individual to the collective that doesn't lose the individual, but sort of sees the collective as, you know, in a, in a gestalt kind of way that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's definitely true of uh, the crucified. Yeah. You know, and I think that this actually works out too, if you know where to look for it, maybe. <laughs> so in my time, in, in my, my LT brief time, um, organizing fast food workers, there were a handful of events that I, I don't know, was a part of, I watched I don't know, online. That's how these things happen. Um, where, uh, you would see connections made between fast food workers in the United States and fast food workers in Latin America, specifically Brazil. There's a pretty powerful, uh, at least very outspoken <laughs> fast food worker union in Brazil. Um, anyways, but they they make all these kinds of connections between these unions. And we've even had like there were fast food workers from the United States who, you know, were kind of organizing with SEIU who, who they went. They went to Brazil um, to like meet. You know, they're, they're societal counterparts. And that that's not the questions that those people seem to be asking in those in those spaces. Right. It's not like, well, actually, you're from the United States. And um, according to like world systems theory, you're I'm actually more oppressed than you. It's like not the conversation. Right. The conversation mm-hmm. is that, like, those two people have more in common with one another than both the CIA, the CEO of McDonald's. Right. They have um, mm-hmm. their comrades. They are people who are organizing for the same fight. And of course, there are complications with that, and I don't want to like cover over those. But I guess what I want to say is that uh, in the spirit of human solidarity and like recognition of struggle, I think that uh, I don't know the crucified people. They exist. They exist as a real collective body, and I think it makes sense not to make not just to think of them theologically, but to think of them like that in reality. I think that's just how it actually exists. Mm-hmm. Right, and A. Carey even continues on that. I think, especially in this kind of global sense, but in a way that maybe helps us keep going on that path. He says the third world, the oppressed classes and those who struggle for justice. um, I like those three together insofar as they are third world oppressed class and people who struggle for justice are in line in the line of the suffering servant, right? This messianic character in Isaiah, even though not everything they do is necessarily done in the line of the servant. And I like that a lot too, right? That uh, for A. Akiria, as a Christian theologian, thinking about these things, he wants to see uh, anybody who's fighting for justice, who's oppressed, who's part of the third world, all these different vectors of kind of thinking about this. um, They're all participating in that historic soteriology, that historic journey to get people off of the cross, (laughs) not to want to keep them up there and commemorate them and hold on to that as a the moment to celebrate, but to see that as something that we're trying to abolish, right? That we don't want crucifixions of, of anybody, uh, Jesus or otherwise. And so to be able to see people, whether or not they are, you know, doing it in the name of Christ as nevertheless part of that kind of historic mission of liberation, I think both expands uh, our understanding of of Jesus and and tries to maybe get us out of some of the parochialism of like, Christian, I don't know, <laughs> Christian people who are too obsessed with like being specifically Christian <laughs> social justice actors. Um, so it gets us out of that trap. Uh, but it also allows us to um, kind of see ourselves as part of a, a bigger and very plural movement of liberation. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the maybe the logical conclusion here of this essay, which is uh, the crucifixion isn't something that you celebrate or you're thankful for. It's something that you try to stop. Um that when you encounter the crucifixion, mm-hmm. you're not there uh, happy that, you know, having the, the happy fault that Jesus is there to save you. And how great is that? Uh, the point is that you're there trying to take Jesus down, trying to take the crucified people down um, in whatever situation that might mean or what that might look like. Yeah. And even in terms of preserving some of that language of what does Jesus do to save us? A. a- Curia helps us talk about that a bit more, too, where he wants to say something like, um, when Jesus dies on the cross, the the moment of salvation is really the transformation into what he calls the, the reign of God. So Jesus doesn't just die on the cross, but he does have a resurrection. And we'll maybe talk more about that when we get to Easter. But uh, the the sort of key for Aea Curia is that not only do we not want to sort of fetishize Jesus on the cross, um, but we want to see the cross, if there's any kind of saving power in the event of the crucifixion, it's the revelation that uh, the structures of sin will persecute you to the point of death if you're actually, you know, trouble, <laughs> if you're actually bothering them. And as I said at the very top of this episode, the haunting thing about reading an essay like this is A. Akira himself was murdered for saying these kinds of things, for organizing with people, right? For being willing to 
uh, mediate between the government and the um, the Salvadoran Liberation Front. Like, uh, at the end of the day, Ayukaria became one of those crucified people, and being able to kind of read that, uh, to see Ayukaria's death maybe even as um, participating in that salvific work, right? Like, uh, we are, in a certain sense, continually saved by all those kinds of uh, martyrs around the world for social justice. Like, it really opens up, I guess, Good Friday in a way that, I don't know, it's not about feeling bad about yourself. <laughs> it's about feeling like, okay, these are uh, opportunities to sort of remember that people are out there, you know, literally risking their lives to uh, live alternatively up to the point of being killed. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, if you subscribe, you can get like, a cool sticker. Um, you can also get an invite to our Discord community, which is really popping off lately. We got a channel about video games. We got a channel about our pets. We got a channel about cooking, and we're always talking about whatever's happening on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know. The Christian commune is being developed there. It's going to be a Luke Axe <laughs> uh, community, right? It's going to be Axe 2, where we're going to be giving according to need, uh, but uh, uh, all all according to digital. Um, that's right. We're going to give you all of the hottest strats for cheese and the bosses and Elden Ring, and that's great. Um, if somebody could DM me and jump in and help me fight this big wolf, I'd be really appreciative. Um, I'm, I'm really annoyed with this guy. <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, we'll see you next week. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early. Besides, I would have.